so worried were people in Brussels about the kind of impact these stories were consistently having on audiences that the Eurobarometer survey, which you probably know runs every six months and is a survey <coughs> conducted in, in every European country, ran what they called a special study, well, which looked at, in a more qualitative way, using focus groups, the future of Europe. And what they found was that people had what they described, these are their words, near zero knowledge and understanding of the functioning of the EU, ignorance of the EU's institutional system, visions of what the Commission does and its responsibilities are very mediocre on nearly non-existence. In other words, basically, what people knew about the EU was either very, very negative or non-existent at all. Can we move on? Um, how does news explain? The most important point in understanding the world around us is what the media tell us about how it works. News is perhaps the last refuge of Mill's first canon of explanation. It has a very desperate need to explain, and those of you who are experts in the analysis of text and language will understand this a lot better than I do. But what it wants is a very simple explanatory uh, trilogy. Uh, it's what I call the culpability model. If we move to the next slide, I'll just very quickly say you need to prep this. It's one of these clever PowerPoints that comes on a bit of time. So can you press the next slide? Next thing. We start with a problem. There's been a murder, there's been a crime, uh, there's uh, the fraud in government, there's, uh, well, the financial crisis. How do you present that simply in the news? We need a culprit. Someone must be responsible. Someone must be the person behind it. There must be a way of explaining how this happened. Understanding it in great detail and complexity is what sociologists do, and they make such hard work of it. What we want to do is explain someone's done something wrong. If you can find the culprit, uh, then you can find the solution, because the solution is very simple. You get rid of the person who did it, or you replace them, or you uh, just punish them. So if we can look at the next one, basically what news is very often doing, and you can see this in so many areas, is simply that model, the culpability model, problem, culprit, solution. And it's a way of very, very much simplifying the way in which events around us in the world are explained. If we want to explain the fiscal crisis, the fiscal meltdown, the credit crunch, well, it's clearly the, the deeds of a few nasty, greedy bankers. Social work is a very common example. The ways in which social work, sometimes social services, goes wrong often says this child has been hurt, not because of complex community problems, but because a social worker has been uh, naughty and unprofessional. We replace them. You get rid of the culprit, and that is the solution. My last point, and I'll try to be brief so we have a little time. The digital divide is a concept that many people would argue is no longer useful. Too simple, too limited. It's been subject to repeated attack since many years ago it was discovered that the growth of use of new technologies, the internet, computers, uh, mobile phones, PDAs and so on, were actually rapid, very much related to people's ability to buy them. The early adopters were just that, it said, but don't worry, over time it will change. It will be just like 30, 40 years ago when people for the first time were getting refrigerators or cookers or central eating in their homes. Of course, richer people or technologically more adventurous people got them first, but there would be an S-shaped curve. So give it a few years and everybody will have one. Well, actually that hasn't happened with the new communication technologies for two reasons. One is that they are themselves rapidly changing. If you've got a computer, it's very nice, but in three or four years' time, people will look and say, that's no use, it's redundant. You can't even get software for it anymore. You need a new one. Or you've got uh, a piece of hardware that people look at, there's this great brick of a mobile phone, and everybody else around you has these tiny little wonderful things that they slip in their pocket. You have to replace the technology. It's not a one-off purchase. And the second thing about the new technologies is how much they require recurrent expenditure. If you've got a computer, you have to feed it. It wants software. It wants a printer. It wants a scanner. You have to buy extra things for it all the time. All the new technologies require recurrent expenditure. 
even if a subscription, for example, is a broadband for the use of the internet. Nonetheless, opposition to the simpler formulations of the digital divide has continued to increase. But in fact, the evidence shows that the diffusion of the internet is becoming more rather than less polarised by different impacts. In the UK, home access to the internet has continued to rise. Of course, more and more people have it. And by this, a uh, few months ago, 18 million households in the UK had some form of internet access, of whom the majority indeed had broadband. Nonetheless, if you look at the divisions of ownership across households in different income bands, it's continued to be very, very serious. Just very quickly moving on. That's a very simple summary of the position uh, only one month ago. That among the poorest 10% of households, fewer than a quarter of the UK had internet access. This is an income queue that's relatively rich in new full stop, and relatively rich in new communication technologies. And the same thing is true if I continue the table across there, if you looked at mobile phones, if you looked at uh, video recorders, whatever, you would find the same kind of breeding. There's a very, very large difference in simple access between those who have and those who have not. So the digital divide maybe needs making more sophisticated in terms of uh, skill, inequities of digital literacy, opportunity, motivation. But we shouldn't run too far from recognizing that it still has a simple truth in its relationship to income inequality. Coming to conclusion then, what can we say this tells us about the so-called information society in which we live? There's widespread evidence, there's actually not more, but actually less mainstream political knowledge. There's been a decline in many countries, and I won't be large on this point here, of public intellectuals. People who are able to argue and articulate in public space the major issues of the day. We live in what's sometimes called the sound black culture, in which politics is simplified, reduced, diluted. We've seen the fragmentation of the news media, so that there are more and more niche opportunities, diversity of choice, but diminishing collective information experience. News audiences, in every sense, seem to be disappearing at every age. It's not just a phenomenon among younger people, it's true right across the age ranges. There is also what some people have called the rise, I think that disappears below the desk, which is very symbolic actually, the rise of what's called our reason, a fascination with mythology, magic, the occult in popular culture. The disappearance of fully elaborated information based on evidence, argument, and reason. And it's, that is most alarming, perhaps. This diagnosis detects the emergence of an increasingly unknowing culture in which irrationality becomes dominant in the absence of widely available information and evidence. So, what does all this add up to? I think that's the last slide. Can we just check? Yeah. What does all that add up to? Well, superficial evidence may be, but it does seem, in general, to point to clearly growing use of the media, growing dominance of the media in providing the symbolic and cultural environment in which people live, but not a richer cognitive environment, perhaps less than ever before. The evidence seems to be that information is more divided, more scarce, less used, and less complete than it's ever been in the past. The possible contradiction, it seems to me, is that the information society in which we're told we live is not actually a very informed society. We're information rich and knowledge poor. And I'd say our task as researchers, perhaps, is not only to examine that and see how far it's true, but also, I think, quite seriously, to challenge it 